Hello and welcome to the Federal Society's webinar call. Today, February 27th, 2023, we're excited to host a post-oral argument courthouse steps on Dubin versus the United States, which was argued earlier today before the court. My name is Kayla Kleist and I'm an assistant director of practice groups here at the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call as the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. Now, in the interest of time, I'll keep my introduction brief, but if you'd like to know more about our speaker, you can access his impressive full bio at fedsoc.org. Today, we are fortunate to have with us John Richter, who is a trial investigations partner at King & Spaulding in the Special Matters and Investigations Practice Group. Mr. Richter previously served as the Acting Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division at the U.S. Department of Justice and as the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Oklahoma. Now, as a last note before we get started throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them via the question and answer feature, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window, uh, so that we have access to them when we get to that portion of today's webinar. With that, thank you all for being with us today. Mr. Richter, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kayla. So, uh, the court heard oral argument today in the case of Dubin versus United States. This is a case uh, involving a criminal statute, a federal criminal statute, Title 18 U.S.C. Section 1028. Um, which portion of which provides a, for aggravated identity theft, a two-year sentencing enhancement. And the statute defines aggravating identity theft as the knowing transfer, uh, no, as, as the knowing transfer, possession, or use without lawful authority of a means of identification of another person during and in relation to certain predicate offenses. And the certain predicate offenses are fraud, basically any fraud statute, um, a, uh, a firearm statute, Title 18 U.S.C. Section 922A6, which relates to making false statements in connection with the acquisition of a firearm, and certain immigration, citizenship, and nationality uh, type uh, predicate offenses. The question presented for the court was whether a person commits aggravated identity theft anytime he uses someone else's name while committing the predicate offense. Um, and in this case, the Dubin case involved the submission of a claim for reimbursement to the Centers for Medicaid and uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, for a service that was not provided in the manner in which the claim claimed. Uh, in particular, um, the case of Dubin involved a psychologist uh, <clears throat> in which uh, the claim uh, at issue um, that was submitted uh, certified that the work for which the claim was being submitted for, gov for government payment was performed by a licensed psychologist uh, when in fact it had been done by uh, someone, a, not a, not, not a psych psychologist. And as a result of which, the claim was deemed to be a, a false uh, claim. The government brought a healthcare fraud uh, for, uh, offense, um, indicted him for healthcare fraud, and in addition, uh, indicted him for aggravated identity theft. And he was convicted, and the conviction was upheld in the Fifth Circuit. Um, in in uh, the, the oral argument today was, was very interesting uh, for a few reasons. Um, first, um, the, the court, the, 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 the petitioner, uh, represented by uh, Professor Jeff Fisher, um, basically argued that the Fifth Circuit's decision uh, stretched the statute too far. Um, basically, uh, he argued that Dubin had permission for the patient, so-called patient L's authority to make use of his name, of that patient's name in submitting a claim. And so that there was no actual misrepresentation or, or uh, use of the name without lawful authority. Rather, uh, there was um, simply, and so therefore the name and the use of the identity was only incidental to the commission of the offense. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, the argument that was made by the petitioner was 
uh, that in, in the context of this particular statute, um, given that, um, that, that there is a underlying predicate federal fraud offense in which the medium sentence uh, nationwide at this point in time for federal fraud offenses is about 12 months and that about 12% of all um, convicted offenders for federal fraud offenses receive probation, that uh, the transformation through the construction of this interpretation of this statute as um, argued by the government in this uh, appeal uh, would transform every fraud prosecution into an identity, aggravated identity theft prosecution, thereby meaning that every single fraud prosecution that would have the opportunity for a two-year mandatory minimum sentence, which applies to aggravated identity theft, as compared to, say, wire fraud, healthcare fraud, mail fraud, bank fraud, where it's a range, um, but there is no uh, mandatory minimum sentence. Um, the court was, was very active uh, today in, in its uh, questions. I think the, the challenge for, the, for all the justices is, um, was the interpretation of the language of the aggravated identity theft statute. Uh, which is, is far from the clear. Uh, it uses phraseology that is pretty broad in, in nature. Um, Justice Thomas uh, led uh, the, um, the questioning. Uh, obviously, uh, Justice Thomas, who has become much more active um, on the bench than his, historically he was in terms of asking questions. And he led off by asking whether uh, Mr. Dubin, the defendant in this case, was authorized to use patient, patient L's identity, um, to which petitioner's counsel said, yes, he was authorized to use for the transaction. The only problem was that um, the, underlying, uh, for the underlying services were provided. They just were not provided by the licensed psychologist. They were provided by another um, lesser licensed practitioner. Justice Thomas used a, an analogy of, um, well, wait a minute, if, if I drop off my Porsche, it was clear, uh, clear then to make sure that he doesn't actually have a Porsche. Um, and uh, when I drop it off at valet, it's, uh, I, dr I drop it off and give them general authority to move my car, but they're not authorized to drive it around, uh, around town. Um, and <clears throat> so then there was some back and forth about that, Justice Jackson um, then uh, uh, wanted to pursue a, a hypothetical about a waiter in which uh, a waiter is given a credit card and instead of, the, of just the food that was ordered um, by the patron, uh, the waiter then charges additional, uh, additional things on the card. Um, Interestingly enough, I would have thought that uh, in that instance, the analogy would have been that, that, that the petitioner's counsel would have said that that was um, uh, not lawfully authorized. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, and then therefore was without lawful authority. Um, but he would have, uh, instead he seemed to concede that in fact, uh, that analogy would be um, actionable under the aggrav aggravated identity theft. Um, uh, it, Justice, Justice Sotomayor um, uh, pursued another analogy uh, involving the waiter, in this case, a tomahawk steak rather than a sirloin steak. Uh, point being is they went back and forth with the justices using a lot of hypotheticals that had little to do with the actual facts of the case involving Mr. Dubin. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Justice uh, Sotomayor um, also then posed a couple of uh, a, a, another hypothetical about, well, what if, if, if instead of a claim for psycho psychological services as here, <clears throat> it was a claim for say cancer services, um, uh, why, you know, why would that be outside the lawful authority notwithstanding that it was a patient? Um, and uh, again, the petitioner's counsel answered that uh, he believed that that individual would be prosecuted could be prosecuted uh, for fraud, um, and um, but uh, potentially not for aggravated uh, identity theft. Um, the uh, uh, 
there, there was then some additional additional argument uh, on a number of other cases. Um, Justice Kagan uh, uh, raised questions about uh, about the uh, the uh, use of uh, and how this might apply to state uh, state fraud statutes um, and under an underlying uh, since fraud is defined as predicates predicate in uh, 1028 uh, is not limited just to federal fraud. Um, and it was back and forth on this in relation to language um, and, and whether that meant instrumental or incidental. Um, they then had some back and forth during the argument about whether the caption, uh, which is name, you know, it lists aggravated ad identity theft as the caption, what effect such a caption might have. Um, and I think uh, the petitioner's counsel handled that fairly adeptly by saying that the caption certainly can have some influence, um, but that you didn't have to rely on the caption to reach uh, a, a conclusion consistent with the petitioner's position. Um, that really the conduct by Dubin um, is at the heartland of, of, uh, of what Congress intended for healthcare fraud, but not for uh, obviously uh, uh, aggravated identity theft. Um, one of the key points that the uh, Petitioner's Council made a number of times is how the application of a two-year mandatory minimum to every fraud, federal fraud uh, case would change uh, drastically uh, the plea bargaining position and leverage in fraud cases um, and therefore uh, the fact that Congress, that this couldn't have been what Congress intended uh, in, in uh, passing this statute. Um, <clears throat> there was back and forth between the meaning of the, the broader uh, portion of the statute that deals with identity theft, um, which is basically knowingly possessing or used in connection with unlawful activity, um, and does not carry a two-year mandatory minimum uh, with the subpart that involves aggravated identity theft. Um, <clears throat> the justices went back and forth on whether this aggravated identity theft is essentially a subset of the broader identity theft statute um, uh, or whether it essentially is an enhancement. Um, and <clears throat> what what the, the petitioner was arguing is that he didn't think Congress would have wanted to transfer every fraud case to a mandatory minimum. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of discussion about a case called United States versus Michael, in which Je Judge Jeffrey Sutton out of the Sixth Circuit um, sought uh, to define in his mind how uh, this statute is, should be interpreted. Um, that uh, if you lie about who received the services, um, then that would fall within the aggravated identity theft statute. If, however, you lie about when or what or how the services were rendered um, in, under, under Judge Sutton's formulation, following Sixth Circuit jurisprudence, uh, this statute would not um, apply in the case of Dubin where services were provided it was an actual patient of the psychologist, but the psychologist did not provide the services. Um, there was uh, a question by Chief Justice Roberts about whether the fact that there had been, what, what if this was overbilling for say three hours and the patient had uh, theoretically say that eight hours of insurance coverage was the deprivation of that extra, um, uh, that loss of that time uh, uh, material uh, to interpreting this statute. Um, the pet petitioner's counsel uh, uh, handled that by basically saying uh, that all fraud obviously involves potential harm, um, uh, but that uh, the harm isn't, isn't textually based and therefore uh, really is, is not for uh, consideration. Um, in terms of, of the uh, there was then a lot of back and forth about the way in which uh, the statute ought to be interpreted. What I think stood out in this case was how each of the justices um, uh, 
came at uh, different ways of interpretation in seeking to um, question uh, counsel uh, as to how they ought to read the statute. Um, and I think, uh, and, and what seemed very clear is that each of the justices were thinking about this case not, and, 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 and interpretation principles, not just for this case, but also for how uh, such interpretation principles might set a precedent for use in other cases uh, that will be coming down the road. Um, so, you know, for example, they, uh, they, they talked about vagueness, they talked about the rule of lenity, they talked about constitutional avoidance, um, and then obviously they talked about, you know, various other um, statutory construction um, and inter interpretation uh, principles uh, uh, that uh, uh, they thought, you know, ought to be, uh, ought to be one or more of the ways in which you know, they could, could um, uh, interpret this statute. I did uh, learn a new rule of construction and just some uh, legal Latin, e justem generis rule, which is a rule of construction um, that follows specific words or general words in a statute that follows specific words in a list must be construed as referring only the types of things identified by the specific words. Justice uh, Coney Barrett uh, raised uh, the question as to whether that principle applied, um, and there was a back, some back and forth about that. Um, I think uh, ultimately there seemed to be, and, and then Justice Gorsuch very much got into and raised questions and concerns about federalism um, and the concern that uh, by applying this literally to every fraud case, um, it would swallow up essentially every, uh, every state fraud case uh, and, and use the analogy that, every, that if, if he goes and orders uh, salmon and was told that it was fresh when he was at the restaurant, and in fact, it was actually frozen, um, that this, in theory, could be deemed to be fraud. And because uh, it was, they used um, the name of the person in charging the credit card, uh, this could deem to, to trigger a aggravated identity theft conviction and a two-year mandatory minimum. Um, obviously, he was concerned that all state misrepresentations would become federal offenses. Um, uh, so the back and forth between the justices, I think, was, was very interesting in that regard. And I think for the most part, uh, uh, the justices seem to be leaning, uh, a majority of them, uh, in, uh, in the direction of trying to find a way to reverse the Fifth Circuit in their questioning of the petitioner's counsel and, and seemed uh, fairly supportive of him during most of the argument. Um, uh, they, uh, they were talking about the title, they were talking about the rule of lenity, they were talking about statutory constructions and canons, and they were talking about constitutional avoidance and federalism. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the response uh, by, um, by the Department of Justice, um, I think in, in contrast, the justices uh, gave the Solicitor General's <clears throat> uh, office a fair bit of uh, trouble uh, during the oral argument. Um, uh, the lawyer for, for the Department of Justice uh, argued, uh, talked about the waiter example um, and, and, and acknowledged that, uh, um, that he appreciated that this particular case was uh, unattractive given that the underlying healthcare fraud um, that was subject to the that, in which the aggravated identity theft conviction applied was one claim for $338 um, and uh, that it was a small fraud. Um, <clears throat> but he tried and tried to make the argument that, well, you still have to pr prove scienter, you have to prove the, no the knowing intent, uh, you'd have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, um, Gorsuch certainly uh, popped in uh, and said that any anytime anyone overbills, it would violate the statute under that instruction. Um, uh, and again, reinforce the federalism and does this really give fair notice uh, to persons that they're violating federal law. Um, it, the justices again repeated as they went and, and 
questioned counsel for the government um, about how the uh, that uh, about how the uh, their their rules of interpretation might apply. Um, Gorsuch emphasized the federalism problem. Uh, a, there was a funny exchange in which uh, <clears throat> they asked him whether it would apply, and, and he said, "Well, it would because interstate commerce applied." Um, <clears throat> the Department of Justice's attorney seemed to be, um, you know, uh, acknowledge the the breadth of the Commerce Clause jurisprudence at the Supreme Court level uh, and federal level, um, and but seemed to be blaming the, <laughs> the Supreme Court for it, which uh, certainly got some some uh, laughs and wry uh, smiles from the court. Um, uh, but uh, Justice Gorsuch obviously was very concerned about notice and federalism. Justice uh, Coney Barrett um, uh, was very concerned about um, a due process because of the mandatory minimum. Um, she saw this as a more serious offense, uh, and yet um, it didn't seem that there was more egregious conduct. Uh, and here, of course, with <laughs> Mr. Dubin, um, it was only $338 of alleged fraud uh, uh, that constituted the healthcare fraud conviction that was the predicate offense for a two-year mandatory minimum. Um, and uh, as you know, Justice Coney Barrett acknowledged to the uh, or uh, made um, the point that in response to some earlier questioning by Justice Thomas, uh, the government's counsel. Acknowledged this was that this was teeny teeny fraud, um, which I think is a very technical way to describe this matter. Um, and uh, but but uh, to the credit of of counsel for the department, uh, and notwithstanding the the pressure he was putting on, he he, he did his best to push back. Um, I think at at the end of the day, but Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Coney Barrett. Um, pressed and, and Justice Gorsuch pressed him all very, very hard. Um, uh, the in, in Justice Gorsuch finally boxed uh, government's counsel in and said, "Well, if the court were to reject the government's theory, what kind of fallback uh, uh, rule would the government support?" Uh, uh, in this case, um, the government's counsel urged that they adopt the Sixth Circuit uh, reasoning, uh, most recently as uh, described by Judge Sutton, um, and uh, that said that this set Sutton test, um, which really turns on the distinction between uh, if, if the name um, was about who received the service was instrumental to the crime, then it would qualify for aggravated identity theft using the name. If, on the other hand, it was simply the use of the name incidental to a fraud about how or when the the uh, uh, the, the fraud was was the claim was uh, uh, the word for the claim uh, was done, uh, then it would not qualify for aggravated identity theft. Um, there was a lot of again some back and forth uh, by both Ju Justice Coney Barrett and uh, by Justice Jackson, who were very concerned about the, the implications of, man, of, of, of this two-year mandatory minimum um, in, in what are effectively uh, potentially cases that would not um, be so serious. Um, uh, and, just, and, and likewise, um, uh, Justice Kavanaugh uh, weighed in that, that, uh, with, uh, the, in the, with regard to uh, Judge Costa's opinion in the underlying Fifth Circuit case that courts should not assign breathtaking scope where a narrower, narrower interpretation is, is possible. Um, Justice Kavanaugh was uh, asking government's counsel about fair notice, about not entrapping the unwary, uh, and, and asked why this case uh, shouldn't fall in that jurisprudence. Um, Government's counsel sought to make a distinction that said, well, in the, uh, unlike other cases, um, this involves predicate crime that's already defined um, and routine conduct. Uh, in other cases, it was just routine conduct by itself without a predicate. Um, I think that was interesting, except that, of course, um, to the degree that uh, you know, 
you're folding aggravated identity theft into basically every every fraud case nationwide. Um, it sort of collapses and makes every fraud case a two-year mandatory minimum uh, at the federal level. Um, and that seemed to be um, what the, what the panel with uh, the court was concerned about. Um, following so the following government's counsel, um, petitioner's counsel had an opportunity for rebuttal, um, and uh, he he emphasized the uh, the in relation to aspects of the offense, um, and and urged the adoption of Judge Sutton's um, approach. Um, and basically saying that if if it's a lie um, about the nature of the claim uh, and not about who received it, then it's not a violation of this aggravated identity theft statute. Um, and with regard to with lawful authority, um, uh, and the, again, it was it was designed to basically say. It's got to be a set of circumstances in which the essentially the name has been taken from somebody um, without their um, without their permission. Um, in, in terms of the of, of the back and forth here, um, I think he finally closed with the real world consequences that he believes um, that petitioners council believed would apply here, and that was that every simple fraud case uh, would would obviously be charged with aggravated identity theft, or at least at a minimum, there would be the threat of it, that that would change, obviously, plea bargaining, um, gain quicker pleas in federal fraud cases, that it would be an extraordinarily strong uh, uh, remedy um, that was not intended by Congress uh, at the time that this statute was passed. The matter was then uh, submitted for consideration and, uh, and obviously we would uh, now, the court will be, be meeting and determining um, who will write the opinion uh, and the various positions um, that each of the justices will take. Uh, I think from a reading the tea leaves, I think the majority of the justices, certainly a majority of the justices were interested in reversing the Fifth Circuit and finding a way to uh, um, narrow uh, the application of the aggravated identity theft uh, stat federal statute. But each of them, I think, was struggling with the proper means to effectuate that end. Uh, and I think uh, what rule of interpretation should be applied in the circumstances, um, all mindful that whatever rule got applied here might very well then be used as precedent to apply in another situation in another case with other circumstances where uh, the application of that rule might effectuate an end uh, that the particular justice would uh, prefer not to see um, or might prefer to see depending on de depending on the nature so um, an interesting uh, an interesting and lively oral argument today in Dubin versus the United States I think government counsel had an uphill battle going into this, knowing that the court had taken it on a Fifth Circuit, from the Fifth Circuit uh, on cert, and um, it played out that way. Um, petitioner's counsel clearly had the, the easier, uh, the, the more friendly uh, bench today. Um, but I think the struggle will be in writing the opinion, and the struggle will be in the breadth, ultimately, of a... Um, of what the opinion uh, decides as opposed and, and whether in fact they um, decide that they want, they don't, they want a, a fairly narrow interpretation in their holding and a remand to the lower courts to um, further develop um, and construe the case law as it may apply to other uh, fact patterns uh, that may come before the courts. So Kayla, that's that's what I've got for now um, on this matter, and uh, happy to answer any questions you or members of our audience may have. 
Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you for that summation of the case, the facts, um, sort of how oral argument before the court, it certainly helps lay the stage as we're thinking through um, sort of the issues at play and the question that may be posed. As a reminder to our audience, if you have questions, please submit them via the question and answer feature as we're now transitioning to that section of today's webinar. Uh, but as the audience is submitting questions, I actually do have a couple of my own that I'd love to pose as we get started. Um, before we get into some of the possible outcomes and ramifications of the case, depending on uh, the ruling of the court, I love to start with some of the definitions at issue and how they were treated in oral argument, especially since you mentioned that the tax was such a big part of what was at issue during oral argument. Um, I know during the lead up to the court accepting this case and sort of the lower court levels, the nature and definition of the term use was a fairly big issue. Uh, you covered this a little in your summation of the facts, but why is the definition of the term use so important in this case? Um, and did it continue to remain equally as important in oral argument today? Yeah, well, obviously use is a very broad term. So, uh, and I think where, where they're where they're struggling is is how to narrow um, narrow the construction so that uh, because in this case, for example, and in every case involving a submission of a claim to the federal government for payment, um, wherein there was fraud, you uh, particularly in the healthcare context that what this case involved, you would have to use a patient's name. So the form that gets submitted, the 5800 form, will have the patient's name and will have other identifying information for the services that were provided by the healthcare provider. Uh, in this case, of course, um, the question is, is, does that mean that every healthcare fraud offense where you list a patient's name and submit it to the federal government is not only potentially eligible for healthcare fraud, but also for aggravated identity theft. Um, and what the court was struggling is, and I think in oral argument, it was clear um, that they didn't see the means and neither did counsel for certainly the petitioner who was urging obviously a narrower construction, see a means to limit the word uh, used because it's generally, of course, the name quote has to be used in every claim submitted. So they looked for uh, really um, in relation to and, and without lawful authority as the, the terms that could be used to uh, narrow uh, potentially the construction of the statute, the interpretation of the statute in order to reach a, uh, a conclusion in which aggravated identity of theft would not apply to each and every wire fraud, mail fraud, bank fraud, healthcare fraud case that gets brought um, not only at the federal level, but would not swallow on top of that, essentially the entire corpus of state um, fraud offenses, at least at, at the felony level. So, um, I, so while, while obviously the word "use" is an important key key part of the statute, uh, I think they focused really more on these other elements in today's oral argument um, because they saw those as a better vehicle for narrowing. And I think uh, the government's counsel was forced to. Um, sort of take the position and did, you know, the government's taking the position that that uh, the statute does apply in all these uh, fraud cases, um, and uh, but spent most of his time trying to parry uh, the questions and uh, um, leading assertions in the form of questions by uh, justices um, who were testing out um, the limits the, of the government's position. Got it. Uh, continuing on the train of thought of definitions, um, is it just a question whether or not uh, sort of aggravated identity theft does apply in the situation? Did both parties put forward definitions of identity theft? And if so, did either of those definitions depart from the way identity theft has been uh, defined both in principle and in practice? Well, I think that's where I, mean, I think that's where the court and the and the uh, advocates uh, we're grappling. Um, uh, everybody knows. I, th I think. I think at some level, the the sense is is that it, at the time the statute was passed, the thinking was of the paradigm that was not present in the Dubin case. Um, was uh, they, everybody was thinking um, of the situation in which literally your personal information is stolen from you, taken from you, and used by someone else completely without your authority 
um, you know, for, for their own gain. Um, and clearly the aggravated identity theft statute would apply in those kinds of circumstances. Here, what made this case hard uh, and makes this case hard for the court is that in this case, the, uh, the claim um, did not involve uh, a, someone who was not the patient of the psychologist. The person was a patient. The person, the patient did receive services. Um, the only question was, is whether those services were provided by a licensed psychologist, thereby uh, in, entitling a higher payment than uh, in fact, uh, the amount uh, that was paid here. In this case, the, the services were provided by a, a different licensed practitioner, but who was not uh, a psychologist. And so the amount of payment was less to the tune of $338. Um, and so I think what tugged at, at the uh, heartstrings and, and makes this case a hard case um, is the fact that I don't think very many people would believe that it's in this day and age that a $338 false claim should subject a person to automatically to a two-year mandatory minimum sentence in federal prison. Um, and I think that that juxtaposed with the struggle and uh, that, that the lower courts have had and the uh, differences that they've had um, has, has led, led obviously to the court granting cert uh, and grappling with this today. Got it. Uh, we have a, sort of a couple comments slash questions from the audience, so I'll go there before pivoting back. Um, does the interpretation laid out by the government in this case leave hospitals and practitioners liable for insurance billing fraud um, if they don't identify properly the medications or procedures they put forward? And what does that mean for sort of patients and clients, if anything? Well, I think what what the court was grappling here, uh, of course, obviously, anytime you a, a party submits claims to the federal government that are inaccurate, it raises the risk of a um, of a potential false claim or fraud investigation. Um, what the court was grappling here is whether, in addition to the question of an underlying fraud investigation. Um, whether of a civil variety or a criminal variety or of an administrative variety, say through a Medicare uh, administrative contractor, is whether and when the aggravated identity theft statute would apply in addition to those underlying fraud, uh, civil and criminal statutes. Um, so of course, uh, when inaccurate information is provided to any insurance company, whether a commercial company um, or a, a government uh, insurer, um, it necessarily raises questions about whether it was an honest mistake or whether there was an intent to defraud. Um, and, and therein lies, and the, and the facts therefore matter in terms of what is found and, and, and the volume and the nature of, of the problems with the particular claims that have been submitted. But what the court noted here was and what, what the court was struggling with is, in, since any claim for payment necessarily is going to relate to a particular patient, um, and that patient necessarily's name, that patient's name will be on such a claim to an insurer, whether the government or, or otherwise, a commercial insurer, whether that aggravated identity theft applies in e every one of those cases, as was urged by the government, or whether it would only apply in circumstances in which the name was instrumental to the alleged fraud. Um, meaning, uh, of course, if, you submit, if a provider submitted claims for a fictitious person, clearly even the petitioner in this case would say uh, that the aggravated identity that statute would apply in addition to the underlying healthcare fraud or false claims act statutes. In contrast, if it was a real patient for real services, but those services were described 
in error or in, in, or in, a, ma in a manner that was wrong or false, and intent could be and and, and intent to deceive uh, could be the requisite cyanar could and 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 mens rea could be established beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the idea would be that a fraud might have occurred and might be able to be proven, but the name was simply incidental to the claim, not instrumental to it. And therefore, uh, because it was the how, what, and when that related to the claim, uh, the claim should not uh, allow the government to add an aggravated identity mandatory minimum uh, charge uh, to um, its indictment. Got it. Thank you. Um, another question from our audience. Is there a statute of limitations uh, on these sorts of crimes? Is it two years, for example, or until the, the crime is identified? And I'll add, does that affect the way the court may be thinking about this? Um, I, there was certainly nothing in the argument or the papers submitted to the court that makes me think that the statute of limitations in, particu in, in particular is um, driving the, the decision making about um, this statute. Um, uh, I have not, candidly, I have not looked there. Is, I would assume that the general federal five-year statute of limitations would apply to this for criminal statutes, would apply to this particular Title 18 offense. Um, and um, uh, obviously that, that would start running from um, the discovery of the defense, uh, of the uh, offense, um, and, and, and or the, consp and the conspiracy around it. So one of the ways the government often gets around five-year statutes of limitation for um, substantive offenses is by charging a conspiracy where if you've got multiple claims over time, uh, you can take basically the latest claim in time, wrap up earlier claims underneath the scope of the conspiracy, use that last claim as the hook for the, for the running of the five-year statute and import the other claims as part of the conspiracy to prove uh, the offense and uh, in hopes of, of ultimately proving um, uh, the total amount of the actual or intended loss. Got it. I'm moving somewhat to the possible ramifications of this case, depending on how the court rules. You mentioned there's a fair amount of discussion around what other crimes might be charged or have this tacked on and be treated as preparatory crimes in this case. Um, there were a lot of crimes that seemed, at least for the white collar variety, that seemed to have been deemed as possibly that could be charged. Is there sort of a perspective on how many would actually, what this would actually change as regards uh, the prosecution of white collar crimes moving forward? There, there was a lot of discussion about, about what, what the practical ramifications are. Um, I think the government, uh, you know, the, the government's council was seeking to, uh, uh, minimize uh, the potential effect, and petitioner's counsel was seeking to maximize uh, the, uh, the, the potential effect in the argument. Um, at a practical level, uh, uh, I, I would expect, um, given that I deal with this in my practice every day, um, that to the degree that there would be fraud claims, and uh, if, if the construction of the statute uh, were as, as broadly uh, drawn as the government um, suggested, um, that we would see a far broader use of the aggravated identity theft um, by the government in fraud cases around the country. As it stands, obviously, any time a case makes its makes its way to the United States Supreme Court, it gets higher visibility, and which would mean that more prosecutors pay attention to it, uh, and the ones that haven't figured it out yet would therefore recognize, hey, I. I've got a two-year mandatory minimum. Um, I can basically threaten to impose that, or we could cut a deal in which a mandatory minimum doesn't apply, and you can take your chances on a range of sentence that might obviously involve something less than uh, two years in federal prison, or, and of course, the aggravate, this two-year statute as an enhancement, not only as a mandatory minimum, but is an add-on. So if you've got a lengthier period of time um, because the underlying fraud, it would add two years. Uh, you know, in my experience as a prosecutor and as defense counsel, the, the simple reality is, is the more weapons the government has to bring to bear uh, uh, in terms of, of duration of offenses and, and any time it 
government has a mandatory minimum or a sentencing enhancement that it can bring to bear um, that provides greater leverage for negotiating purposes uh, in plea bargaining. Um, and um, it's a common technique to, you know, note for defense counsel or a defendant that there are certain other offenses that could be charged um, and let them know of that, um, but that it for early cooperation uh, and acceptance of responsibility to a, a different offense, uh, there may be a deal that can cut that doesn't involve the application of that mandatory minimum. Um, how that works in any particular time is somewhat dependent on the exercise of prosecutorial discretion um, by, at, um, by federal prosecutors, uh, as is supposed to be influenced and governed um, by general attorney general um, policies involving the, uh, the charging of criminal defendants. There's a bit of a yin and, uh, yin and yang uh, between Republican and Democratic administrations as to exactly um, where that line ought to be drawn, uh, but suffice it to say that having a mandatory minimum certainly provides greater leverage, and that certainly was the petitioner's point, uh, which was that um, you would would see this being used uh, in run-of-the-mill fraud cases far more uh, than Congress ever uh, thought when it passed this statute. Got it. Uh, continuing on in that vein of sort of what the possible ramifications are if the court upholds Dubin's conviction, is there, was there discussion or is there the possibility that this case would affect um, crimes and charging and prosecution beyond the traditionally white collar arena? Well, uh, obviously the, for the aggravated identity theft, the predicate crimes, as I noted, um, are threefold, fraud, um, one one offense under um, uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 922 related to um, firearms and immigration, citizenship, and nationality uh, related offenses. So, uh, uh, and again, the question is going to be, um, and, and obviously in the immigration context, then uh, presumably any kind of immigration fraud um, is going to be um, affected by the ruling in this case. So if the court uh, does rule and, and seek to narrow um, the application uh, of, of this statute, um, uh, it will apply not only in fraud cases, generally speaking, but in these other classes of cases that are noted in the predicate offenses under the statute. Got it. Thank you. Um, switching to the other uh, hypothetical, uh, what are the possible ramifications uh, if the court sides with Dubin, as you mentioned, may be possible? Uh, could such a ruling limit the capacity of prosecutors to go after crimes in this vein, or are there other ramifications that might occur? Well, undoubtedly, if if uh, the court sides with Mr. Dubin, uh, and whether it whether it's through a, a definitive ruling construing the statute. Um, or a ruling uh, that that in some way remains into the Fifth Circuit for further consideration, consistent with the court's opinion. Um, uh, what, however, that it, it gets uh, handled, undoubtedly, uh, it will obviously make a bit of a difference for Mr. Dubin, and that um, there's a better chance that he will not have two years tacked on to uh, the existing sentence um, that he received for the underlying other fraud convictions uh, that are not before the court um, in, in his uh, um, third petition. Um, with regard to other, uh, you know, potential um, individuals who've been, who, who will be charged or have been charged in the federal courts, obviously how, the, how this case uh, gets, how the court ends up construing the statute and interpreting it is going to govern every federal case out there and, and is going to govern every time a federal prosecutor is thinking about this uh, and whether aggravated identity theft applies or doesn't apply in the context of a, uh, a set of circumstances in which this enhancement might have formerly been thought to have applied. So I think those are the ramifications. Um, and, and, the, and likewise, as, as is often the case when the court makes a ruling and, and uh, applies principles of interpretation to, to a criminal statute, um, both the government and the defense bar will look very hard at how the court applied those rules of interpretation to see how those rules of interpretation might 
also be deployed in other with other statutes and other circumstances so they can check and as 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 various challenges as various cases are being brought and charged by federal prosecutors and as defense counsel are looking for ways uh, to challenge statutes um, and say that they've been misapplied or inappropriately applied or should not apply to a particular set of circumstances for a particular defendant. Thank you. Um, taking a question from the audience, uh, how does this, how does the, the ruling in this case affect the capacity of those who have had intentional um, improper occurrences, by which I think they mean um, intentional fraud committed against them or in their name, uh, how does it affect their capacity to have remedy, if at all? Um, well, identity theft in its purest variety, meaning if someone has, has effectively um, uh, taken uh, someone's identif identifying information and used it for their own purposes, uh, entirely out of whole cloth, clearly remains uh, unlawful under this statute. Um, what the court was grappling with in this, in the Dubin case, is a situation in which someone has been treated by a a uh, a provider, uh, a healthcare provider. That provider actually provided real services. So the person was truly a a a, a patient. Um, and um, and obviously gave their name to the provider to submit a claim for payment for the services. Um, the question is whether that whether that name by itself and the use of that person's name in the context where they had given a permission to submit a claim on their behalf, when the claim itself is uh, fraudulent. Um, the question is, is, does the aggravated identity theft statute apply or not? And of course, what the court was grappling with is a bit of, of the when, what does law, what does with lawful authority mean? Um, what does in relation to mean um, and, and during in relation to the offense mean? Um, and uh, uh, all, all towards the end of trying to determine whether um, there is a reasonable means to con construe the statute more narrowly um, or not. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, two last questions. The first, you mentioned there's at least one case that came up in oral argument is perhaps uh, presidential in this case or determinative. Um, is there precedent that would be affected by the way the court rules in this case? Um, and what sort of the, might the ramifications be? Well, sure. This is, you know, anytime you've got a, a, a split in authority at this courts of appeal level, which we had in this matter, um, the ramifications of a Supreme Court decision will, um, is, are supposed to resolve the circuit splits. Whether it will ultimately resolve the circuit split depends on the nature of the actual opinion uh, issued by the court. Um, but the court is certainly going to, assuming the court does rule, um, will you know, necessarily uh, uh, have to be internalized in the jurisprudence of each of the courts of appeals. So in this case, obviously the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals precedent in the Dubin en banc decision and panel decision uh, at some level will, will have to be reversed if the court sides with Mr. Dubin. If it sides with the United States, it won't. And then, and then you'll have a, have a rule um, that applies nationwide. So yes, the lower courts necessarily anytime um, a statute is constructed have to take that into account and must follow the Supreme Court's uh, ruling to the best of their ability, their sworn duty to do so. Well, thank you. And your, your mention of the uh, nature of the decision tees up my last question pretty perfectly. Um, you mentioned that if you had to guess, you're, there's likely to be a reversal of the Fifth Circuit's decision in this case. And that's what's actually sort of going to be the um, place where the rubber meets the road is sort of how the justices get to that decision. Um, so following on on that, if you do you have a read, even a general or unsolidified one, as to what those interpretate frameworks may be um, and how the various members of the court will break out on the issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a, a, a bit of a pass on prognosis. Fair enough. Who does what when. Um, I think it was pretty fair to say um, that that Justice Jackson, Justice Sotomayor, Justice uh, were were very troubled uh, by the outcome in the Fifth Circuit, and were were asking questions and pressing counsel very hard to try to 
ascertain how they might, um, how, you know, what 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 the the bases might be. Um, I think a number of the uh, uh, more recently appointed uh, justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, uh, likewise, uh, and and Coney Barrett seem to all be um, uh, interested in uh, exploring ways in which uh, the case might be turned around. Um, uh, you know, was was Justice Alito had a few questions. The Chief Justice had a couple. Justice Thomas had a couple. Not clear exactly where where they came down. They didn't show their hand quite as much as others. Although you got to be careful when you listen to questions and uh, from judges um, and justices. Sometimes they may come across as being completely in your court because they ask questions that seem to be very friendly to you, and uh, ultimately they they in, in, you know they are persuaded by other things as they consider the case and its ramifications um, after the, the case has been submitted for, uh, for uh, decision. Um, likewise, of course, the court's gonna have, will have had its conference to discuss the matter. Um, opinions get circulated uh, amongst the justices to sign on to, um, and, and, and judges then will, will have an opportunity to to you know, agree or disagree with one another, and then decide what they can agree to or not agree to. Um, so it's really, really always difficult to to, um, uh, to, to truly prognosticate uh, very successfully. Um, but uh, it, certainly, the tenor today is we can say the petitioner council uh, had a friendlier bench, um, at least in uh, the types of questions and the arguments um, that and the questions that were asked of him. Uh, than uh, government's counsel did. Fair enough. Well, we'll wrap it there. Uh, no more questions from me or the audience. So on behalf of the Petra Society, thank you so much, Mr. Richter. I really appreciate the benefit of your time and expertise today. And thank you to our audience for joining and participating uh, at the end of a Monday. We welcome listener feedback at email at info at fed-soc.org. And as always, please keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about other upcoming virtual events. With that, thank you all for being with us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>